we have a school system, schooling system that, you know, if you get it wrong, we'll let you know. So inadequacy is a big part of our society because you got to get it right. We'll test you on it, we'll compete and all these other things. So inadequacy becomes this really negative thing when it's perfectly okay to feel inadequate in circumstances that you're new to and that you're not familiar with. Oh, everyone's favorite, stressed. We all feel stressed, overwhelmed, burdened, out of control. Stress is actually a positive language. It's a positive communication and it is saying, I feel like I have too much to do. And you probably do if you feel it. And then, then the, unmet, uh, the unmet desire is to have success in managing one's life. Stress is almost always about you're doing too much or you're doing something that you don't like to be doing, which in my opinion is too much. If you're doing something you don't enjoy doing, that's heavy. You can have the rest of the day off and you'll still feel stressed. You can have nothing else to do other than this one thing that you don't like to do and you'll feel stressed all day. So stress is a language that's saying, look, you need to really reprioritize what it is that you are doing with your life. Should you be doing it? And are you doing too much? You can be doing a whole lot of stuff that you love to do, but you'll stress yourself and your body and your spirit, your mind will let you know you are doing too much. I can't handle all this. That's what stress is really about. And that's what the language is really saying. And the obvious way to relieve it is to look at the things that you can eliminate, even just at least for the moment, until you get a sense of balance back into your life. Because there's only so much you can do. And it's very important for certain types of people who are really dynamic or really creative. You can do a lot in your mind. You could, a lot seems possible in your mind. And so you, you, you think of all these wonderful things that you'd like to do. And then when you go and try to do them, you realize your physical capacity to do all of them cannot match, match your mental capacity to come up with different things to do. There's certain people where everything seems, oh yeah, yeah, we can do that. Oh yeah, that's, that's fine. Oh yeah, it's a great idea. Until you find at the end of the week, like, oh my God, I can't do all this stuff. You know, it was great in my head. I was seeing myself doing it all in my head. But when you actually, and that's the, the measuring system. That's the thermostat in your system saying, great, you got great ideas in your mind, but we can only physically do but so many of them. So stop on some of them. Back off on some of them. That's what stress is saying to you. And fearful. Fear, the last one. Does anybody know what DHEA is? Never mind. <laughs> DHEA is the master hormone in the body. It is the master hormone. It is the hormone from which all other hormones. I just I like I like that concept, master hormone. From which all other and you know hormones are kind of related to emotions and how you feel and everything like Fear is the master hormone of all of these emotions. Underneath it all. You know, if, if I was to take all of these things that I just read off, I'd put them here and I'd put fear up here with lines going down to all of them. Underneath every single bad feeling is fear. You're inadequate, you fear that you're not good enough. You're stressed, you fear that you're doing too much. You're sad, you're feared that you might not get back what you lost. Fear is the master. And, it's, and I think we've, we've all heard before, you know, it's, when it boils down, you have fear on one side, love on the other side. So fear is really underneath of it all. But fear can be specific in that you know, when you're, you know the difference between being afraid of something and being sad about something. But be mindful that underneath all of these is fear. When you just don't feel right. You don't feel safe. You don't feel comfortable. That's fear. Because in your natural state, as they say in, in, in the different philosophies, in a place of love, everything seems all right. You're all right. You're good enough. Everything is fine. And anything that takes you away from that is fear. So fear, anxious, worried, insecure, frightened, scared to death, these are diff different levels of intensity. And that's just the inner voice saying, I think something bad is going to happen. I think I'm not safe. And that 
also can be heavily influenced by the past. Just like I said, a dog can, call, can walk in and one person get really happy. Another person will get really scared. Maybe that person was bitten. Maybe that person was attacked. Maybe that person was always told, be careful. You know, be careful when you're walking to school. You go, pa you go past Mr. Johnson's house, he might have the gate open and there's that big mean dog in there and he'll bite you. So you know, you learn to be fearful of these dogs. So fear can be very conditioned. Now, this is where it gets juicy. Because all of these emotions that I've just talked about, you can either deal with them as they are communicating to, that, to you, or you can do the one thing that everyone does in the face of a lot of these. You can distract yourself. You can get bored and watch television. You can get angry and not do anything about it. Or you can go drink. You can go drink the anger away. You can numb yourself so you don't have to feel the anger. Distractions are what people do instead of listening to their emotions. They will distract themselves and there's millions, multitudes of distractions. And you know what? Even though distractions is not an emotion, it's a language. If you're distracting yourself, it's a communication that you are not wanting to deal with a primary emotion. If you're sad, and you've lost something and you've decided to distract yourself rather than seek out what it is that you've lost, then you, you haven't dealt with the emotion. So that's what we do. And this is what leads to frustration. So this is going to be the important part because now we're going to break off from primary because I want, I want by the end of this, I want people to understand how they can unravel what's going on with them. What happens to you when you don't listen to this language? If you get, if you get stressed about something and you know that your system is saying to you, you have to slow down, you have to take some of these things off the list and you say, no, I have to do this stuff, I'll drink some coffee, I'll take some drugs that will kind of speed me up. I will not listen to this system. I will distract myself. You get angry. You distract yourself. You get bored. You get you, you distracted. Whatever feeling you get, if you distract yourself, it is a temporary escape from that feeling. And you go after your distractions. Your distractions are meant to make you feel good. Whether you eat a comfort food, uh, whether you watch television, whatever it is that you do to distract yourself, it is a momentary escape from what you should be dealing with. And the reality is when you come back to it, it'll still be there. This is where frustration steps in. Frustration is a secondary emotion. So know that if you are ever feeling frustrated, frustration is not what you should be dealing with. It should be the emotion that you are not dealing with. Imagine a, a loop, all right? You get sad, rather than deal with it, you distract yourself, so you eat. You eat some comfort food. You feel good for a little bit, now you come back and you're sad again. The sadness didn't go anywhere. So you go and eat some more. And you come back, oh, the sadness again is it, it, here again. That's what frustration is. That's that sense of, oh, this stuff is still here. Oh, this, this stress is still here. You know, that's what frustration is, that sense where you go, oh, I can't believe this is, you know, this is still here, this is still here. Frustration comes when you do this loop of not dealing with the primary initial emotion, not dealing properly with the anger. It, anger is a good one because if you, if there's something unfair in your life, let's say your boss is treating you unfairly, you don't say anything about it. You go home and you just try to forget about it. You distract yourself. You watch television, you go out and do something. You go back the next day, and there he is again. Doing that same unfair thing. When you should, and, it, and this could apply to anything. To any person, friends, spouses, children. They're doing something that you feel is unfair. You're not responding to it. You go and distract yourself. You come back and it's still there. You come back and it's still there. Then, now you are frustrated. And you're thinking that the frustration is what you have to deal with. Now, I feel frustrated. i got to do something about this frustration. i got to seek something out with regards to this frustration. 
when the reality is that always behind frustration is one of these other ones. Frustration is always a build-up, and it is a communication of what I'm doing is not working. Tina, can I just um, ask you something? Yeah. Um, you, when you talk about uh, the emotion, if you are having the experience of that emotion, can you use EFT at the time, or something like that? It's not always the case that you can go up to the box and say, hey, you know, so EFT might be something like that, that you could just, so it's just to be present and to clear it out maybe energetically. Absolutely, and whoever, and for people who are not familiar with EFT, as soon as I get finished with uh, the depression, I'm going to talk about EFT. I'm going to talk about, and we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to show you, again, it's going to be something that you can take home with you. Because the reality is, as she said, you can't. You're at work, you're, you're, you've got this anger, you're afraid that if you do it in a certain way, if you speak up in a certain way, it's really going to get you in a really bad place. And that's a lot of times, that's when we, we, we step away from these things because like, oh my God, if I explode on this guy. Now mind you, the defusing is the explosion shouldn't be happening. There's, 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 there's a, a constructive way to deal with injustices. And we see it all around the world. Some people get angry and they'll go blow, blow other people up. Some other people get angry and they get diplomatic about it. You know, they want to negotiate. Let's, let's come to terms. Let's get a win-win situation. So some people have things to defuse. And that's why in this language thing, and I'm glad that you brought that up, I want to introduce the idea that we'll have a technique that we can go home with and I can teach it to you in five minutes and it'll be yours. So that when you find yourself overly angry, now it may be an unjust thing. It may still be unfair. But if you're ready to chop his head off, then we have stuff from the past. Because there's one thing that children are also good at, the death wish. I wish you were dead, I wish you were never born. They mean that. <laughs> in that moment. Then they come back and they're sorry. But in that moment, they, you know, if your head blew up, they'd be like, that's what you get. And then later they'd be sorry. But the death wish is real. Children have the death wish is real. And when I've worked with people one to one, and they, you know, and I have them Sometimes they regress back to childhood and they are really angry. You know, I have them and they, they feel it. They say, I wish you were dead. I, I just want to kill you. I just want to strangle you. I have them grabbing pillows and, you know, they need to get that out of the system because that is, it's intense when you're a child. Injustice is really intense. Not only when you're a child, but even later on in life, you know, so that can get really intense. And that's what the frustration build up. If you don't find a constructive way to deal with these emotions, you'll find a destructive way. You'll either internalize it and destroy yourself, become very self-destructive, manifest all kinds of diseases, or you'll be really dysfunctional and hurtful to other people in relationships and work environments and friendships. It's important to make sure as much as we can in our life that we don't get to the level of frustration because after that, things can get really out of hand. What do you do with anger from your past, about your past, which you can't do anything about now? So. Oh, 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 the techniques of it. The techniques of it. And it's not just that. I mean, you can, that's, why, that's why there's a whole field of, uh, of professions that deal with defusing, because it is very important. It is extremely important. Everything that I'm saying to you right now, every action, Every movement of my body, every, everything that I'm doing is almost like, just try to imagine multiple flashes, that I, like I'm really flickering really, really fast. And flickering from the very time that I came into existence as a light beam, not even conceived, as a, not even conceived in the womb of my mother, that my entire past is coming through in these multiple flashes. And I'm grabbing all kinds of stuff. Every single word that I'm saying to you now, I learned in my past, this whole vocabulary. How to move my fingers. How to walk as a kid. That whole memory is coming through to manifest what I'm going to share right now. And it happens repeatedly. It's, it's, it's a bit like quantum physics kind of language. So it's not, it's not, we don't walk around actually know, you know, being conscious of this. But I'm conscious that I'm like this flashing bulb that goes, I go all the way into my past and I come all the way back in microseconds of flashes. Everything that I'm doing comes from my past. 
everything that I'm able to do is because I've done it in my past. I don't take information from my future. I send information into the future about what I would like to do. But everything that I do, everything that I know how to do, my ability to speak comes from my past. So my ability to interact with women comes from my past. So how did I interact with women in my past is going to influence how I want inter interact with women today. How I interact with the work environment, how I interact with nature, everything that comes from my past. So when people find themselves like thinking uh, there's something wrong, I don't feel good, this isn't working out, that's why there's this whole field of different therapies that says you got to go into the past and defuse things because that is your reference point of how you will respond to the present moment and what you will project into the future. So I'll, I'll go into that because this is not an always this is not always a present day present moment exercise because in this language that I'm going to introduce you there's there's going to have to be a dialogue. For example, you're angry, and the language is, this is unfair. You have to ask yourself honestly, because this isn't just a one, two, three. This is, I'm angry, so there must be something unfair going on. Then you have to ask yourself, is it really unfair? If the answer is yes, how can you make it fair? If the answer is no, then you have to ask them, why am I angry about it? Why am I angry about this woman with the red shirt when she hasn't done anything? <laughs> Got you tonight. You kind of <laughs> you notice forever, she put, never, never. <laughs> you notice she, she put the coat on to block the red shirt. Kind of, no. It's it's this ex, it's this example of you have to make this dialogue because if something happened in my past, it can go the opposite way. Why am I so intensely attracted to this woman with the red shirt? I don't even know her. Right? I could, have, I could have had three or four different girlfriends from my teenage years who loved to wear red shirts. Or every time we'd go dancing, they'd wear red. I'm going to react to that. And I don't even know you. That's how powerful the subconscious mind is. It has all of this information. And it's going to determine how you feel about certain things or certain people in life. And that is why you have to do this careful dialogue. Is it really unfair? Was the person really being unfair? Am I overreacting? So I have another question. What about the quantum world, right? Because mm -hmm. in the quantum world, if you're going to take a CMI, like a clear mental image, right? And that your future starts today, that the past, because you know, if you, even in the secret or whatever, I hate that, that you, the no. secret, but anyway, it's the one that most people, the point of reference that most people would know. Mm -hmm. And in that, they say, whatever happened in the past is in the past. So that you create your clear mental image and that you move into that, you know, that you can change your emotions and feelings around things and that you can move into that so that you don't always have to keep delving back into the past to clear out the rubbish. So you see, I have, I... slightly conflicting, you know, no, because and, I have... and NLP techniques as well. You know, NLP techniques are based on the past as well too, you're reprogramming, but I have I have, if I was on a debate team, I would have a response to that. You can't outthink your inner child. You cannot outthink your inner child. If positive thinking, if thinking works, because in The Secret they also tell you that if you think negative, you're going to get that, right? So if we're going to use that as a premise, if we're going to say our thoughts really have power, right? Okay? So there's the woman that is you today, and then there's a five-year-old girl in you. She's still alive. I always like, in, in, in the book that I wrote, I gave the analogy that think of yourself like a tree. If you cut a tree, you'll see all these rings, right? There's a little ring right in the middle. That ring is the one-year-old tree. It's still alive. It's part of this bigger tree. We like to think of ourselves as, oh, yeah, I used to be five years old. No, 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 no. You're five right now, and six, and seven, and eight, and 17, and 22, there's these rings of a living tree. There's these rings of a living human being where all of your experiences, and they're all there to make up who you are today. So the five-year-old girl was criticized. And let's not, because I don't want to throw age or anything, but let's say there's a woman who's 30 years old, you know, and she was badly treated when she was five years old, and now she watches The Secret. 
And, you know, this, you know she's, she's, she's not getting what she wants in life. She's having terrible relationships with men who just remind her of her critical father, who died when she was five years old. But he criticized her up until the age of five. And that really impacted her. So she's got all these men. And now she's watching The Secret. And you know what? I just got to start visualizing better men. Men, that I know, and I know exactly what to do. I'll visualize men that are the exact opposite of my father. Now, here's the trick. The five-year-old is still alive, right? She's not dead. It wasn't, wasn't 25 years ago you were five. You're five years old right now. And not only that, you've been five years old since you were five years old. So here's the trick. You just saw the secret. You're 30 years old. You want a better man in your life. The five-year-old girl has been thinking for the last 25 years that all she deserves and all she wants is daddy's love. That's all she's looking for. And she's been thinking that for the last 25 years, putting that out into the universe and keeps getting men that are just like her father that she wants them to love her because she always wanted daddy to love her. Does that make sense? Yeah. The power of thinking has to be applied in both circumstances. That you are thinking from now and you are thinking from your past. Your past is constantly thinking all the time. The five-year-old girl, the seven-year-old girl. And trust me, I speak about this with a level of confidence because of the amount of people that I work with one-on-one -on -one and they're telling me this is what my problem is today yeah. and within 20 minutes 15 minutes I'm talking to a five-year-old and she's telling me about how daddy treated her I'm talking to a seven-year-old boy who's telling me about how mommy used to treat him and people a lot of times are completely oblivious to these things these levels of yourself, these ages, are still alive and vibrating, sending energy out into the universe. Every child wants to figure something out. And especially the one thing that they really want to figure out is, why am I not being loved? I thought this was a given. I, I love everyone. Children love. Children love to love. It's just natural. You don't even have to explain it. They don't, they don't even know what it is. It's default. So, so the moment someone stops loving them, a child goes nuts like this. Whoa, I didn't know this was part of the game. What is this? Notice how in life people chase the people who don't love them. They don't chase people. people when you find people, I, I see a lot of times people are chasing the, the people in life who they want to love them. Because it is a given to a child. There's nothing special about it. There's nothing unusual about it. If, you, if a child is loved by his or her parents, they don't really jump for joy. You know, they're already in a state of joy. But show that child that you don't love them and you, they, you will see them in conflict. Not only that, you'll see them try to do everything within their power to get the love back. Because they don't understand. They don't understand why it's being taken away. It, it was never meant to be like that. And so I see later on in life, a lot of people are chasing people for their love. How many, have, how many people have ever seen the example of, you know, someone who is really, someone who is really loved by another person, but they're obsessing over this other person that didn't love them? I see that a lot. I see that a lot. And, 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 and I see it flip-flop. One, you know, one moment they'll be the loving person and the next moment they'll be in a relationship where the other person is overly in love with them and they're just kind of like, oh, back off, back off kind of thing. It really plays out a lot in relationships. It really plays out a lot. So there's a lot to defuse from the past. Very important. Because the past is going to determine a lot of times how we feel that we should feel about what's going on in the present moment. Sorry, can I just ask, for the five-year-old who doesn't understand why she wasn't loved, yeah. loved then how do you get, the, how do you either, the five -year either you bring, so you bring the five-year-old energetically into today, and do you give them the love that they didn't get, or how do you explain to them, how does that work, sorry, that do you is, either fix yeah. it so they get the love, or they never had the love, yeah. so they're never going to understand, because it's still only five, but it's still here today. That's the, important, that's the important work to do, the dialogue, the inner dialoguing. The, the emotions are what we, kinda, what we try to look to defuse, whether you're using hypnotherapy, whether you're using 
TAT, any kind, all the kind of different therapies out there that are meant to defuse a misplaced emotion. What do you mean by defuse? There's a lot of there's a lot of techniques out there now. We've come a long way with psychology, and 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 um, we've really gotten beyond talk therapy, and we've come to understand that there's a misprogramming, a mis kind of. Uh, um, we are fused in a certain way. We're Energetic. energetically we're fused to react, react or respond. I always like to give the example of, of let's say you know let's say there's a woman who's who's um, um, she's allergic to bananas. And let's say she comes to me and 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 I don't I don't look at dietary stuff and everything. I want to you know I want to understand why are you reacting to bananas. And let's uh, and let's we go through and this person regresses back to the age of seven, and she's in the kitchen, and she's eating a banana, and suddenly dad comes walking around the corner, and he freaks out. What did I tell you about eating between meals? What did I? I don't. You shouldn't be. And she freaks out the moment she's eating this banana. She's now infused with the memory without even knowing it. That this whole mind you, when something dangerous happened, everything in the environment is dangerous. Your subconscious mind registers everything. You're consciously registering, oh my God, dad is mad. And that's not good. Your subconscious mind says this whole entire environment is dangerous. Later on in life, you can have an allergy to bananas. Because every time you eat bananas, your subconscious mind is remembering, dad freaked out last time I ate a banana. And it can happen once. My favorite, favorite example is a guy who's about in his 40s. Real story. He's working at a job and he's really good at what he does. And he knows he's the best in his department, but he never goes and asks for a promotion, even though he can get it in a heartbeat. He never goes and asks. He just feels awkward. He just doesn't feel right. And he, here he is in his 40s. Even everyone else in there is kind of like, why doesn't he ever go ask for a promotion? Like, he's like the best in here. So this guy decides to go to a hypnotherapist. And the hypnotherapist hypnotizes him, regresses him back to the age of seven. And you know what happened? Once. One time. This isn't repeated conditioning. One time in his life. And you know what? It was a positive experience. It was meant to be a positive experience. His favorite teacher, one day at the end of a class, everyone walked out and he said, Hey, come on, come here. I need to tell you something. Don't ever think that you're better than anyone else, okay? He was trying to give him a positive, important lesson in life. Don't think yourself to be superior to other people. This kid said, this, I, this is my teacher. I love this teacher. He's a great teacher. My great teacher is telling me, I better not ever think of myself to be better than anyone else. So when he was sitting as a 40-year-old man in his 40s, he did not want to go ask for a promotion because he felt as though he would be saying, I'm better than everyone else in here. And he is. But he wouldn't go ask for the promotion. And that only happened once. That's how quickly you can get infused. Now, here's the magic of it. You can get infused with a trauma in 30 seconds. Why can't you defuse it in 30 seconds? That's the part that the field of psychoanalysis would not like to know. Because they make a career off of sitting you on the couch for the next 10 years trying to defuse the banana. <laughs> and everything that the banana means. <laughs> no, if you can be traumatized in 30 seconds, why not? If your system can go all wacky, your energy system goes zzzz, why not? Why can't there be a technique or techniques that can defuse that in just a quick amount of time? And we've discovered stuff like that. We, we have now have very quick things that can... For example, would get you, if this happened to you, you would remember that incident where you were in the kitchen. And, and, and as you remember it, you get this, this is what I will be introducing afterwards, you get the system to go all funny. Oh, God, yeah, I remember when you yelled at me, and oh, it's making me cringe. And you can defuse that by certain techniques like tapping on certain meridian points that rebalance the energy. And I'll get into that, but that's what will that's what will be a very important part for understanding how to deal with having dialogues with this inner child. And because you can't just tell a child, you can't just tell your inner child, "Oh, look, it was just it was then, it was that," you know. 
Uh, dad was upset. The child does not understand any of that. And, and not even coming from you. It understands this reaction. And that's the part you have to defuse. Then you can tell your inner child, look, dad was having a bad day. Don't take it personal. You're safe. You're okay. Look, you survived it. That's a different part of the work that you should do in your own life of how to defuse these things so that they don't continue to influence what's going on in your life. So let's, let's take another quick look at frustration. And a reminder, frustration is you're not dealing with the primary emotion. It's a secondary emotion. It comes next. So you find yourself frustrated, you need to ask yourself, what am I not dealing with in my emotional world? Am I sad about something and not dealing with it properly? Because frustration is a buildup of your not looking. There's something that I put in here. I put to meet your needs through honest efforts. You really have to be honest when you're frustrated. You really have to be honest when you're frustrated. If you're frustrated, you have to honestly, what is really bugging me? And you have to go back to the primary ones. What am I sad about? And, and, and in which I keep distracting myself. And now it's building up this frustration. So you have to be really honest at the point of frustration. Why? Because you're now two steps away from the solution. So you have to backtrack. And when you're frustrated, the last thing you're going to do is think calmly. The last thing you're going to want to do is think to yourself, i got to go back two steps. No, I just want one step and I want this over with. You actually have to go back to the primary one. Because if you don't, if you don't, this frustration, distraction, back to the emotion, oh, I'm still sad, I'm going to distract myself some more, I'm still sad, I'm going to distract myself some more. Now I'm frustrated because this isn't working. That's not how, you know, that's, that's, that's how you should have the dialogue, but that's not how you have the dialogue. So in other words, you start building up. You start boiling. When you get frustrated, you're really getting intense, and this is really getting frustrating. Depression, the most misunderstood emotion of all, is what comes next. Depression is actually your system trying to shut you down because the frustration is like a boiling pot and it's about to explode. Depression is actually turning the cooker off. Because what do you feel when you're depressed? You don't feel like doing anything. It's actually a positive thing. The problem is you're three steps away from the problem now. You're depressed, you don't know why. Because yesterday you were frustrated, now you're shut down. Depression is actually a, an attempt to try to get you to stop and think and, and start over. It's natural. It's not something that we should get rid of. It's something that's telling us, stop. What you're doing is not working. That's the frustration. Depression is, I quit. And sometimes you just need to quit. Sometimes you really need to stop. Because what you have done up to this point has not worked and is not going to work if you continue it. So the depression is actually trying to stop you, slow you down, give you a moment to start over. And most people don't allow that. They'll, they'll, they'll drug themselves, they'll do whatever, they'll continue in the, in the cycle of distraction. And How many people have heard of people who've dealt with depression for a very long time? You don't have to deal with depression for a long time. You can get out of it very quickly. But you have to take those steps backwards. You have to say, alright, I got frustrated. I'm depressed because something. I tried to deal with something in the wrong way. And so, what again was originally this is a this is a uh, this is there's primary emotions there's the secondary is frustration and then there's tertiary that's third down the line and this is all a mechanism to try to help you all right stage one we're trying to let you know there's an emotion you need to be dealing with all right you're not listening to me stage two now we're going to make you frustrated because it's not going to work all right now you're not listening to that stage three shut them down turn off and you can't you can't win with depression that's that's like that's the worst one, but that's why the body uses it for you. It's like, you're not going to listen? Fine, we'll shut you off. <laughs> that's the physiological part of you. That's what that part of you do. It controls your energy. It controls your heart. It controls your system, your digestion. You know, you, can, you get depressed, you lose your appetite. You get depressed, your heartbeat, you know, it's kind of slow. You feel sluggish. You're like, your system has that power to shut you down because you're not listening. That's all depression is.
A language is saying, look, you're not listening, so we got to turn you off. We're doing you a favor. We're actually doing you a favor. And a lot of people don't listen to that. They want to go see a doctor. They want to get medications. They want to go take more drugs, whatever. Depression is, is a thing that's letting you know you've gone too far. You're not listening. So we have to stop you because it's the one thing that you need to try to do. And that's why I always tell people, if something's not working in your life, stop doing it. I, always, I, have, the, I have a positive affirmation that goes, if something does not work for you, stop doing it. But I, I have another way of putting that that people don't like because there's too many negatives in it. Say no to what does not work for you. There's a lot of negatives in there. Say no to what does not work for you. That's a positive affirmation. That's a positive thing you can do for yourself. And a lot of people don't know what they want to do. And so I ask them, what don't you want to do? And they have a whole list. Like, stop doing them. <laughs> At least you'll have that to do until something pops up and you figure out what you want to do. In the me if you don't know what you want to do, in the meantime, stop doing what you don't like to do. It'll give you some positive energy. And that's the language that depression is basically saying to people. Stop doing what you're doing. It's not working for you. You might not know what you, you might not know the right way to do it. You might not have a positive solution or a positive way of approaching it. But at least stop the distractions. You know that doesn't work for you. You know that doesn't make you happy. So stop doing that. And believe it or not, some, a lot of people when they come out of their, their, their depression, they're actually happy that they had that time to sit and think and ponder over things. You know, for a lot of people, unfortunately, they, they, they're permitted to use it as an excuse. Oh, he's depressed, we'll kind of leave him alone. You know, and that alone time is time where you can think of how do you want to do things differently? Because that's what depression is trying to give you, an opportunity to rethink and do things differently. Go back to the drawing board so that you don't get back into this cycle. Let's pass this out. Because feelings are partly a physiological thing, in fact, feeling is a word that has to do with physiology. You feel something. You feel something with your skin. That's what feelings are. You feel something in your system. And we tend to label it as, I feel bad, or I feel sad. And generally, you'll feel it somewhere in your body until you reach the state of depression, because then you don't feel anything. You feel numb. Because you're not listening to anything. I mean, if, if, if uh, you're angry and you get a racing heart, and you're not responding to that, then they'll try, you know, the body will try something else. And if you're not listening to that, at some point, depression or uh, numbness is that, look, you're not listening to your feelings. You don't have any at this stage. We, don't, you know, we can't work with you. It's just shut everything down. But feelings apart from that are generally registered somewhere in the body. And we can feel them. We can, we can feel the response to them. I'm not an EFT practitioner. And I have uh, found certain limitations with EFT, so I've moved on beyond that. But I've appreciated what they have discovered with EFT. And what they've discovered with EFT is that if you stimulate certain points on your body, it's the same as the ancient acupressure, acupuncture systems that the Chinese have been using for thousands and thousands of years. You uh, stimulate a certain part of the body, a certain point, and it, uh, it rebalances the lungs, uh, rebalances the heart, uh, rebalances the bladder, rebalances the kidney. Something they've been working with is just nothing to them. But they work with rebalancing that organ. You know, that's what they used it for. Now, someone came along and started to use this uh, accidentally, came across this idea of tapping on these points rather than using needles. Now, this was out of the set. How many people are familiar with EFT? So, how many people are, are not familiar, have never heard of EFT, don't know anything about it? No, I have heard of Okay. How many know the history of it? The history of it is, is interesting to know because it, it, it leads me back to why 
I developed my own way of approaching it. Um, Dr. Callahan in the 70s, I believe it was, was he's a psychotherapist, he's a hypnotherapist, he's a psychiatrist, Roger Callahan. He had a um, client that he was dealing with. Now, back in the 70s, thing, it was really, you know, 60s and 70s was an exciting time because a lot of things were being introduced into the West. A lot of uh, uh, pioneering stuff because people are experimenting with things, whether it was drugs, whether it was dance, music, clothing. You know, it's a particular time in history where you have a lot of creative stuff going on. So the, in the 70s, uh, kinesiology was coming around. Uh, the ancient uh, acupuncture system, Eastern philosophies were were being exposed to mainstream kind of people. So this Roger Callahan, who's a psychiatrist, and is starting to dabble into these things because it's becoming okay. You know, you can you can kind of get away with it. You don't want to be too loud about it, but you can go ahead and take a course or something like that. And I appreciate people like this because they look into different areas because they're finding that what they're doing with people is not enough. They really want to, you know, there's certain people out there who really make breakthroughs and it's because they really have a genuine heart. They really want to help other people. And they can be honest with themselves when they say, you know, this isn't really helping people in the way that I'd like to. There's got to be something else out there that, that really helps. Or, or in the case of Mr. Callahan, you have a particular client that's determined but tough tough to crack. I mean, I mean, he was working with this woman, Mary, for a long time. And she had a very intense fear of water. Extremely intense fear of water. And he tried everything. He tried regression, hypnosis, um, psych, uh, drugs. He tried every type of technique, everything he had learned, and it would just not go away. And I mean, it was intense to the point where she had, she couldn't bathe her children in a tub. She just couldn't be near water. And couldn't find anything in her past. I don't know, I think he maybe even tried past life stuff. He tried everything, and it just didn't work. Mean, in the meantime, he's studying kinesiology and he's studying the meridians and all these, you know, he's getting into this uh, Western, I mean, the Eastern medicine. And one day he's sitting with Mary and they're uh, at his practice and he's sitting outside and, they're, and he has a pool, a swimming pool in the back. And so he's sitting about maybe 50 meters away and they're exploring this. What's this fear about, you know, here we are again, next session, you know. She says, doctor, you know, I know logically that the water's there and I'm here and I know it doesn't make sense, but I just, I'm frightened. I'm frightened. Logically, this doesn't make sense. I'm frightened and I could just feel it so terribly in my stomach. I'm just really frightened. And he just thought, wait a minute, stomach, stomach. This is the stomach meridian. Now, he didn't have any needles. But he just, it's like one of those hunches. She said stomach, I feel the fear in my stomach. And he thought to himself, all right, in, in Chinese medicine, you can rebalance the stomach if the energy is off by stimulating the meridian points along the stomach. Not having any needles, he said, can I try something? She said, go ahead, you've been trying for years. You know, if you got something else you wanna go ahead and try, go ahead. You know, and I'd say at this point, she was, she was at the point where, you know, she, she didn't mind if this guy was coming over to tap on her. So he goes over and he starts tapping. This is the stomach meridian. The beginning point of the stomach meridian is here. So he's tapping on her, tapping on her, tapping on her, tapping on her, just kind of going with the hunch kind of thing. Everything went on for like maybe 30 seconds to a minute or something like that. Suddenly she j jumps up and starts running over towards the water. And he's like, oh, what the hell? What the hell did I just do? What did I, what's going on? And he's like, Mary, Mary, no. And she turns around and stops. She says, don't worry. I know I don't know how to swim. But she continues to run over to the pool. Starts splashing her face and splashing the water. She was like, oh my God, I don't feel it. I don't feel, I'm not afraid. It's gone. It's just gone. I mean, literally, just like that. Gone. Now, he didn't know, he didn't, he didn't know what he stumbled upon. He kind of made the connection, but I don't, he, he started to make the connection. But later on in life, I think st still even up to this, to this point, he has not come to the theory that I've come to. Um, subsequently, everyone who came in was tapping here. And all his clients, from that day on, every client that came in, can I try something? Go ahead. <laughs> you know, and a lot, you know, a lot of the other clients were kind of like, uh, uh, what are you doing? You know? <laughs> I still feel sad. You know, he's like, do you still feel sad? Yes. <laughs> Shoot. 
you know? So he was trying this on everyone. And then at a certain point where, where certain, you know, um, people were saying, no, I, I, Doc, I still feel it. I don't, you're tapping on me. You know, he would say, all right, we could, let me just try one more thing. So he'd tap on the kidneys. So he'd be tapping here, tapping here. And then with some people, it would go away. But, oh, wow, yeah, it just went down. I don't feel it as much anymore. So then he started, you know, playing around with all of the other different meridians. And because he was the originator of it, unfortunately, he had the task of explaining this to other people. Now, certain people, when they're pioneers of something, they have a level of ownership over it. And that's unfortunate. Because here he had this very simple thing, and he made it very complex. He later, he later developed uh, what, uh, what he called algorithms. So if a person came and said, I am fearful, you would have to tap here, and here, and here, and then here again. And that's the algorithm for fear. Now the algorithm for sadness is you tap here, you tap here, you tap here, and you tap here. And he had all these algorithms for every single imaginable emotion, feeling out there, you know, manuals and kind of... And he was getting very rich off of it. You know, fair play to him. He discovered something great, he got success. But he had a student, and his student, his name was Gary Craig. And Gary Craig was uh, from Stanford University. He's a professor. He's an engineer. You know, anything, you know, he's not channeling angels, seeing energy. He's an engineer. He's working on engineering. But as an engineer, he's extremely efficient. Engineers like the things to be very efficient, effective, and shrunk down. So he, go, he hears about this, uh, this, this uh, thought field therapy, TFT, that Callahan had developed. So here's this engineer guy who's taking this course, which costs about 10000 to learn this new TFT, because it is really fast. I mean, look, back in the 70s and, and the early 80s, if you were a psychotherapist and you had a client for five years who had a fear of heights, you know, and you hear someone saying, hey, we can get rid of that in five minutes, your ears are going to perk up. And when you actually see it get done, you're really going to be interested. So I can understand why he was charging so much. He was really on to something. He was saving people money, even though, you know, for some people it's like, man, I can't afford that. <laughs> anyway, Gary Craig takes the course because he could afford it. Gary Craig, in his engineer mind, is watching all these algorithms and this and that. And then, so Gary Craig says, wait a minute, there's only 14 points. Why not tap on all 14 points for everything? <laughs> no, no, no. That's absurd. You have to do the algorithm kind of thing, you know. Because what Roger was trying to understand was, what is fear... How is fear manifested physiologically? Your heart starts to race, your lungs kind of go funny kind of thing. So he wanted to specify the certain things that need to be turned off. Quote unquote turned off. Because what gets turned on when you get fearful? And that's what needed to be turned. So he wanted to make it specific for everything. So if the bladder has nothing to do with it, then that shouldn't be included. But Gary Craig is saying, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. You got 14 points. It's only going to take you about 30 seconds to tap on all 14 points. So why not just do all 14 points for every single problem? And if the stomach has nothing to do with it, you didn't really lose any time. It only takes a couple seconds, then you go to the next point. Roger was, no, 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 no. And that was very fortunate for Gary Craig, because Gary Craig said, all right, fine, I'm giving you an idea. You don't want to run with it, I'm going to run with it. And he did. He created a worldwide movement. A worldwide movement. And you know what the first thing he did? You talk about, you talk about spirituality in people. This, this is why, as like I was saying at the beginning, I really, I, I'm interested in people who really do unique things and really put things to the test. But one of the first things he did was he put together a manual and put it out there for free. And thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Because he said, wait a minute. People can, if, if, if my theory is correct, that you can just tap on all 14 points for every single problem. This is the truest self-help technique, therapy, mechanism in all of human history.
Like you can learn these 14 points quickly and now you have it yourself. So he, he thought the spiritual thing to do is people need to know, people are suffering. People are going through years of therapy, paying a lot of money, not really always getting success and not getting the results that they want. Because you know what? Talk therapy doesn't have a good track record. Psychiatry certainly doesn't have a good track record. And certainly and psychology doesn't. So here's all these people suffering, really looking for an answer, really looking for something. Gary knew it worked because he did it himself. He was doing all the tapping stuff himself too. And so his first thought was, wait a minute, this needs to be in people's hands. This isn't just for professionals. This is for a person who's sitting at home suffering because they're angry about something and they can't let it go. So one of the first things he did was put together a simple manual showing where the points are, saying just tap on the points, and coming up with the, the theme, try it on everything. Just try it on everything. See where you get results and see where you don't. What Gary did that took us away from understanding what it could be that is happening was that Gary in his engineer effectiveness efficiency wanted to really make it simple for people and fair play to him for doing that. He took away these names because he didn't want to get into explaining meridians and what the meridians are. So this became the eyebrow point and not the urinary bladder. This is the urinary bladder. This is the stomach. This is the kidney. When you start messing with 5,000 year old systems, you're going to miss the point. So in doing that, most of the EFT field were clueless as to why this works. It's really very simple. When you take away the understanding of what you are tapping on, then you take away the reason why it works. And again, this is only hypothesis and theory, but it makes a whole lot of sense to me. Okay, so just to bring back to the root of from the beginning, you're actually accessing the unconscious mind. You're going straight to the unconscious mind here. You're fine. This is an alternative communi communication system to the unconscious, the physiological part of you that makes your heart start to beat. But the subconscious is going to keep triggering. So it's just a band-aid, is it? No. 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 And I'll show you why in just a moment. In fact, now, when you have something in your life that makes you feel unsafe, master hormone, fear, because that's what it all boils down to. You feel unsafe in yourself. Danger equals you have to react or respond. And there's three ways, flight, fight, freeze. That's the three major ways that you're going to try to get out of a dangerous situation. And you're physi physiologically wired for it. What happens? Your heart starts to beat. Boom, 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 boom. You're afraid. Your lungs start to breathe so you can have more oxygen. You're actually, you're gearing up to run or to fight. Last option is to freeze. It's, it's a different option, but unfortunately, and, and it goes along with the language, depression is, the la depression is a form of freezing. Your blood is rushing, your bladder goes funny, your kidney goes funny, everything kicks into gear for the flight or fight. All you have to do, huh? Your immune system? Your immune system shuts down because you just don't need it right now. All you have to do, and this is what I did. I went back and I, because I wanted to understand these meridians. When I was learning EFT, I was learning it through the manual. I downloaded the manual. It worked like a miracle. Like immediately, I had stuff that I was dealing with that was just kind of going away. I found myself giggling afterwards. I was like, wow, this is, this is something else. And I really got to look into this a, a whole lot more, not a little bit more, a lot more. So I wanted to understand these meridians. So when I saw the meridians, what they actually were, what they really were, it just clicked. For me, it just clicked immediately. I was like, wait a minute. If we're rebalancing the meridians of the lungs and the heart and, and all this, then we're turning off the flight or fight. It's that simple. But if you take away these names, then you don't know. You're looking at the eyebrow point, the collarbone point, the under the arm point, and you're not getting the sense of what this ancient system is doing. It's calming down the flight or fight danger mechanism. 
you're tapping and stimulating, and in, in essence what you're doing is you're sending a signal, as she was saying, to the unconscious mind, false alarm. So here you have this memory, dad freaked out when I'm eating the banana. I remember the memory and my heart goes all funny. So we tap on the heart. You actually, you find it. You find the trigger and you tap on the point. Now, as Gary Craig says, just tap on all 14. Because when you have this response to this thing, you have the physiological response. If you can turn that off, then you can look back at this thing and not react to it. So that when it happens nowadays, you won't react to it nowadays either. You don't get the, you don't get the emotional physiological reaction. Because physiologically, we've turned the energy off in the lungs, in the pericardium, in the large intestines, in the small intestines. Which is why I brought all of the points back in. Gary Craig has taken the points out. When you say you turn the energy off, what is that? Is that a scientific way of saying something? No. Yeah, that's a, an, a, an energy. These meridians are real. They've taken, um, um, I forget where, it's either Norway, somewhere here in Europe, there was actually scientists who took these kind of radio, this radioactive uh, material and put it on certain points, all different points, and this radioactive kind of material started to travel. When you put it on a, a certain point, it would travel down a line on both sides. If you put it at a different other point, it wouldn't move. It would just sit there. So they actually, they took the ancient Chinese system and started putting these, this radioactive material on people and they watched it under, you know, under special lenses. They watched it travel along the same exact lines that the, that the Chinese people had mapped out. But that's like with cancer. I mean, the primary site. And usually now, and still, allopathic, or well, orthodox medical systems still can't see, like, um, I know somebody with kidney cancer, and he had, and the second site um, was um, lung cancer, and then the tertiary site was liver, and it was like... The same track as, as, the, as the meridian as the track. Meridian, yeah, and oh, I remember saying it too, um, a Chinese, years and years ago I said it to a Chinese practitioner, you know, um, uh, acupuncturist, and they said, the next site will be... Will be. <laughs> and then that's, that's the and, next and, thing and that starts to break down. And still haven't said, they just say, oh, it appears here, they don't... See the connection at all, so it's really mm. interesting. So let me just try to, most people said they're already familiar with EFT, but hopefully what I'm explaining to you tonight gives you a different perspective mm -hmm. on how you'll be using it now. Because mm -hmm. I basically say to people, look for the things in your life that trigger you. When you grab that, whatever emotional reaction you get, turn it off. It's the actual exercise is that. So if you're getting angry with your boss and you're overreacting and you know that if you react then you have to pull back and use something like this. You have to turn off the overreaction. If you're getting angry and your heart is about to burst out of your chest, that's too much. Uh, there's things in life that I get angry about. I watch the news and I see something unjust and I feel angry. But I don't go crazy. I don't find myself half an hour later still... <laughs> My God, uh, you know, that's overreaction, and the overreaction is basically from the past. Now, here's what's interesting when you start doing your own kind of regressive work. When you are, when your subconscious mind is trying to indicate that something is dangerous, it just doesn't have time to communicate with you. It doesn't have time to rationalize with you. It doesn't have time to explain things to you. It doesn't tap you on the shoulder and says, look, you know, I think you should be scared, and here's my reasons why. No. It doesn't communicate with you, your conscious self. It communicates with the unconscious. It says, oh my God, danger, um, make the heart beat. Boom, 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 boom. So you're, you know, your heart is racing, your stomach is all funny, whatever the case may be. What can happen with this kind of meridian stimulation is that you can have something in your life Let's say there's a person that agitates you, and you don't know why, it's just the person agitates you. You don't feel comfortable around them, or whatever the case may be, or, or, or you know, there's certain things, and you're just, why is this, why am I reacting in this way? So here's your first trigger. This person is agitating me, and you have a reaction to it. 
So if you're tapping, if you're stimulating, and you're trying, you know, you're, you're calming your system down. Now let's say it's your heart rate. Let's say when you think about this person, your heart rate really starts to go up, and you're just like, oh, you know. So now you're kind of you're tapping through, and you get some relaxation. Now you think about this person, and you don't get the heart rate, but suddenly you're feeling like a queasy stomach. So it's like, okay, so now you got to go back and do a little bit more. But it's like the heart thing isn't working. Now, mind you, these are all strategies that your subconscious mind and your unconscious mind together are trying to get you to stop whatever it is that you're doing. You know, or trying to get you to be afraid of something where consciously you really shouldn't be afraid of it. So, first line of defense, let's make your heart rate go up. Because in life, that might be the one thing that makes you run in any situation. That may be your weak point. A lot of people have weak points. You'll have in your body places where there's a weak point. So if anything makes you uncomfortable, you'll feel it in your stomach. And then you'll, you'll, you'll go away, you'll avoid it. When you develop something like that, that's what your mind will always use to get you away from whatever situation it doesn't want to get you close to. Other people to be the heart, other people to get tension in their neck. It's different for every, other, every person. Some people feel sadness in their heart. Some people feel sadness in their stomach. Some people feel sadness in their back. You know, different parts of the body. But that's the mind has a way of getting you away from things by getting this, you know, this, this response from you from a racing heart. So let's say you do the technique and now you don't get the racing heart. The subconscious mind is like, that's not working. Okay, we need to try something else here. So you go back to the memory or you go back to the, the, the incident that this person agitates you. Now you kind of, you don't get the racing heart anymore, but you kind of got like a queasy stomach. So you do some more. So you, you think about this stomach, you know, you're trying to bring down the intensity of this feeling inside your stomach. That goes down. It's like, uh-oh, we can't use the heart. We can't use the stomach. Let's, you know, let's put some tension in your neck. That's why with these kind of tapping techniques, you have to kind of follow it around. You have to focus on your heart and the fear that's in your heart. And then, you know, you focus on, like, the one woman who had it all in her stomach, she was fortunate. She had the fear of water in her stomach. So all she had to do was think of the water, tap on the stomach, gone. It's not like that for everyone. Some people may have a complex way of feeling fear. They'll get a queasy stomach, a beating heart, lungs all choked up. You know, so you've got to dismantle all of that a little bit of time. The fascinating thing that I have found is that eventually, eventually, once you have defused all these physiological reactions, what the subconscious mind does, it says, fine, you're not listening here. This is the reason why I don't want you to do this. And you'll actually remember stuff that you didn't remember before. It'll give you the actual reference point. It'll give you that memory of when you were five years old, seven years old, of, of you being in the kitchen, dad yelling you about the banana. And now, you know, because a lot of people show up to me and they don't know what's bugging them. This, or, you know, it's like, my God, every time I eat these bananas, I break out. I eat, every time I get these, you know, these, it's just, it's strange. What, I don't know what the hell this is, this is all about. I have, I, and, no, I don't talk about that. <laughs> I've seen some interesting things. <laughs> you, you, you walk, even with myself, even with myself, I wrote about, I wrote about it in my book, where when I was first starting to come to the Buddha bag, um, I would feel uncomfortable on Thursday. On Thursday morning, I would start feeling uncomfortable. Now, by this time, I'm well into all this tapping stuff. And this is also some things that I discovered that, that EFT has limitations in. You really have to listen to the body. You really have to let your body communicate to you and not just try to do it all in your head and do it all tapping on points. And this is something that I learned very much from my experience with a feeling uncomfortable on Thursdays. So it, was, you know, one, it happened one week, and this is when I first dedicated myself, because before then I would not go out in the evenings. I had an excuse. I did not drink, I didn't do drugs, the social scene, and I don't want to be around people. I'm like, so I just stay home, I don't eat out in restaurants. I had tons of excuses and tons of reasons why I wouldn't go out in the evening. The Buddha bag was the one reason, was the one place that I, I ran out of excuses. I was like, I had no reason not to come here. Great people, 
interesting evenings, no pressure to have dra drugs or drink or anything like that. So I was like, ah, right, well, you know, that's, I have no more excuses. I got to go to this thing. You know, I have a lot of my friends there or whatever. So the first week I go and I'm feeling uncomfortable. I get here and I go home and it's fine. And then the next week, the next week is when I noticed, I didn't notice that it was a Thursday. The next Thursday, I woke up and it was the same thing. I said, wait, wait a minute. I remember this feeling. This feels familiar. And the last time I remember this feeling, it was last Thursday. Now, what the hell is going on? What's, what's, what's today? Oh, I'm going to the Buddha bag tonight. Nah, it can't be anything to do with the Buddha bag. But I had the feeling. So I said, all right, I'm turning everything off, turn the phone off, and turn the computer off and everything like that. And I said, I'm just going to sit with this. I don't know what the hell this is about. I literally did not know what this is about. But I see a pattern that I'm going to go to the Buddha bag tonight. So I sat down. A lot of times you can just do that. It's not you can just sit. You have a uncomfortable feeling and just sit with it. And just tap. And see what happens. So I'm just tapping and tapping, going on for a little while. Next thing you know, I feel my shoulders moving. I'm so fine, I'm going to go with this. I don't, there's nothing coming into my mind, but I, I feel this tension in my shoulders. So I'm just kind of going with it. My shoulders are moving up. And it's weird because you're doing it. It's like, what are my shoulders doing here? And I'm just letting them do it. And I'm feeling my head kind of sinking down. It's like a turtle. It's kind of like <laughs> shrinking down into myself. And then it got really, it started getting really more intense. But I was so fascinated by it that I was just going to keep going with it. Because it can get scary. And if you're by yourself, you're just kind of, oh, what the hell is this? You can kind of stop. But I thought to myself, no, I'm really dedicated to this stuff. I, I, want, I want to know. And at the same time, I was like, wow, this is really neat. This is cool. Look at my shoulders are just doing it without me. I didn't, you know, I'm not even giving them permission. And they're kind of going. I was like, this is weird. So I'm scrunching down and I'm tapping and scrunching down. And next thing you know, I close my eyes and these words came into my head. Please don't hit me. I was just playing with my friends. And I just started crying. And I kept repeating it. I mean, frantically repeating. Please don't hit me. Please don't hit me. I was just playing with my friends. I was just playing with my friends. And just in that moment, the memory, I felt like a nine-year-old boy. I literally, my body, my eyes were closed and my body felt like a nine-year-old boy. And my mother had really beaten me bad when I was nine years old. Because I was out playing with my friends. I had gone out. And I was having fun with my friends, and you're supposed to, uh, and, and when I was growing up, when you see the street lights come on, that means it's time to go home, because it's going to get dark soon. We all knew it. But that particular night, I was out playing with my friends, and we were in front of their parents' house. So we were kind of like watched over. So their parents let them stay out. So as a kid, I'm like, I'm going to stay out too then. You know, we're all okay. Like my logic was, I just want to play with my friends. We're okay. I know the streetlights are on, but hey, you know, we're out in front of, of the house. So I just kind of, I, I stayed out late and I went home. I went home a happy kid. I had a great time, you know. Uh, and when I got home, my mother beat the life out of me really badly. And I didn't know that as a nine-year-old kid, I had registered in my mind, I'm never going out again. It's not safe to go out at nighttime and have fun with my friends. And I was coming here and having fun. I was coming here and enjoying myself. And here's this system kicking in, danger, 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 don't do this. Don't go. I'd feel funny on Thursdays. And eventually, if I would have kept at it, if I wouldn't have done anything about it, I'd have found an excuse not to come here anymore. It's tricky. Mine is very clever when it's trying to get you away from certain things. You'll, you'll find yourself in certain times in life avoiding things so cleverly You'll have justifications, you'll have excuses, and they'll sound completely, perfectly legitimate to you. And when you unpeel the onion, you find out underneath of it, you took on a statement as a child. As a child, I took on a statement. It is not safe to go out at night. And as an adult, before coming to the Buddha bag, I'd have every excuse not to go out. I created a lifestyle that did not include going out in the evening. Because my childhood mind registered that it's not safe to go out and enjoy yourself in the evening time with friends. There's danger in that. But that unfolded because I kept tapping. And so I relaxed, first of all, the feeling of discomfort. And so the body 
tries to step two, all right? He's not responding. He's still going to go tonight, so let's get him kind of... So what your mind tries to do, in essence, is it tries to get you as close to that original scenario without completely going there. So I get the tension in my shoulders. I get my head going down. I get the squinting in my eyes and all this. It's like... It, that's, it's trying to avoid me going back into that scenario because that's the danger. If you go out at night, Tino, you run the risk of being beaten up. If you go out and enjoy yourself, you remember when we were nine, what happened? So let's not do that. So when I make a determination, determination, and this also goes back to what you were talking about earlier, when you want to project into the future what you want to do, see how you are reacting to it. Because if you have these terrible relationships with men and you don't realize it has to do with something from your past, when you go forward to try to have these new relationships, you have to examine all of these different layers of how you are reacting to it. If you're going to go for a new kind of job, if you're going to go into a new type of situation, you have this wonderful mechanism that allows you to just kind of dismantle it. And I've had tons of different examples of the kinds of stuff that I have uh, unveiled just by using this. Sorry, can I just, can we just go through the, because I'm confused, I'm confused with the board scene, right? The, so do you focus on the body or do you focus on the trigger? So you know you focus on, the, you fo yeah, you focus on the trigger and see how your body is responding to it. So you know the movement part of it, so say it starts off in your chest and goes to your shoulder. So, Yes. How many? How many people? How many people in here have someone they can think of that makes them angry? <laughs> everyone? Mostly everyone? What about you? Yeah. We can all do this together. In EFT, there's what's known as a setup. I don't have it on here, but it is really good because it gives you a way to set things up. And anger towards someone for me is very fun because I, you don't have to name anyone. You can all bring that person to mind. So we start here, and, and there's, a, there's a very universal basic statement, basic thing you can do for any of these. Any of these. So I want you all to say, think about this person. I can feel heart rates going up. Okay, and you say, even though I have this anger towards this person. Even though I have this anger towards this person. I choose to relax and be at peace with myself. Even though I have this anger towards this person, I choose to relax and be at peace with myself. Even though I have this anger towards this person, I choose to relax and be at peace with myself. Now we'll go through the points together and just say this anger towards this person. Keep thinking about that person. This anger towards this person. Next point. This anger towards this person. Next point. This anger towards this person. This anger towards this person. Just under the eye there. Next point. Under the nose. This anger towards this person. This anger towards this person. And under the lips there. Again, this anger towards this person. Just keep thinking about the person. And just there on the collarbone. This anger towards this person. And you might find that you get the sensation to sigh or take a deep breath, or you might find yourself relaxing down, or you want to yawn. That's perfectly fine. That's perfect. It's called emotional relaxation. So just under the breast there, like in line with the nipple for the woman it's underneath the, the underneath the bra strap. Just on the on the ribs there. This anger towards this person. And under the arm. This anger towards this person. And just on the side of your fingernails. This anger towards this person. And the other fingernail. This anger towards this person. And the middle finger. This anger towards this person. And on the other side of the ring finger. This anger towards this person. And both sides of the pinky. This anger towards this person. Take a deep breath. Tensions, she's getting a lot of. And you examine. Are you getting any kind of reactions in your body? Are you feeling more relaxed when you think about this person? 
Have you noticed something different from before and after? Is your heart rate a little bit less? Or has it gotten more intense? And if it gets more intense, your system is saying, don't go there. And the thing you need to do is go there. Because mind you, when I was going all funny like this, like I said, I said, whoa, what the hell is this? What are you doing? No, no, no. All right, let's go back to something else because this is weird. Your system will try to stop you. How many people can think about this person and they feel less anger towards the person? How many people are still the same? How many people has it intensified, getting stronger? Okay. I'll try, I'll try to keep this as much a demonstration because there's, a, there's usually a lot to unfold. You know, there's, there's more. So let's just, let's go around again. And this time around, because you have to be clever with the subconscious mind. You've gotten, it's almost like you've gotten enough out of that. So you have to kind of change the wording a lot around a little bit. And you say, even though I still have some of this remaining anger. Towards this person. I choose to relax and be at peace with myself. Even though I still have some of this remaining anger towards this person. And if you, get, if you get that sensation, take a deep breath or sigh, don't worry about the words. That's more important. That's an emotional relaxation. You get the sensation to yawn, stop the words, yawn. And even let yourself tense up and kind of, good, let it out. That's emotional release and relaxation. So now mine starts to hate though. It, it'll change. <laughs> how, how, are, you, are you okay with that? Like, you, you're, you're revealing some things. Oh, yeah, are you okay no, no, no. with that? Remember what I said earlier about the kid who has the death wish? You know what I would do in a situation like that? You look at the person. You think, I see you, I see your eyes are squinting. Like, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And you just keep tapping, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. <laughs> and you can have a lot come out. You can really start to have a lot come out. So, here you have something... And keep tapping, especially if you're feeling all of these. One of the things that I've learned is how to memorize these points. And I can just talk to you and keep tapping. I know where all the points are. Once you memorize this, you have one of the best tools, one of the most amazing tools to kind of relax you down. And every time you yawn, that's an emotional relaxation. That's a good time to check in and say, all right, how, how do I feel now? See what's there now. Has it intensified? I got my own going stuff going on here. <laughs> Those are important to keep checking out. But when you, once you learn the mechanistic part of this, you memorized everything, after that, it's intuition and creativity. I didn't read this stuff in a manual. A lot of these things, when I, if, if, if I were with you now, I would say just that. All right, now I want you to tap on a point and just say, I hate you. Just get, I don't even know who the person is. Don't need to know. No one else needs to know. We can all hate him or her. I think it's him. No, <laughs> <laughs> no that's yours, too. That's mine. <laughs> <laughs> and you would just... Here's, here's the... Because in traditional talk therapy, psychotherapy, you have to avoid getting the client over worked up. In this, no. The objective is to get you worked up because you have the mechanism to turn it off. This is as effective as you are able to be honest about your situation and the honesty that you have in revealing exactly, because you're not allowed to hate people. That's not nice. But if you do, you, you, you do yourself a lot of good to express it. So in a situation like that, and I've done it, I've hated my mother. I hate you, 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 I hate you. And you just keep going, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And you'll find, you might tense up or you, you have, I've had my arms go crazy on me. But my mom used to bit, my mom used to beat me. And I was too small to fight back. But in nature, your physiological flight or fight, by nature, you are capable of fighting back. It will kick in automatically. You'll feel the tension in your arms. You'll get it, you, you'll know how to, you know how to fight and run by nature. And when you don't do it, you lock it in. You wish you would have punched her head off. And that wish doesn't go away. And anytime anybody ever reminds you of it, so there's times 
And it's weird because as an adult, you know, like I can fight, I can box, I can, I can, you know, I can look nice, I can do some Muhammad Ali type stuff. But when I'm going into some of this stuff, and I, you know, I start turning into a nine-year-old, it's like, do it for me, do it for me. It's like, wow, I thought I knew how to fight. <laughs> Back then, I obviously didn't. But you may find like you're going into this intensity. It's like, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And next thing you know, your hands, your arms are trembling, and you just start. Swing it out, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. You gotta get that stuff out of your system. Because the one thing that I've learned with EFT, the one thing that I didn't like, because I got all the training videos, and later on I would see that as Gary Craig was taking out certain points, because he found that if you just tapped on certain points, you still get some effectiveness. In fact, with the original Mary, all they did was tap on one point, and she got some results. And as you, you would know, the whole entire meridian system is connected. In fact, there's a pathway that goes through the whole thing, one to the next, the whole. So you can tap on one point and you have access to the whole system. The problem is you might have to tap longer. And that's what I was finding. As the training videos went on and he was taking out more points, the sessions were lasting longer. It was taking longer to get to get something to calm down, get the anger to go down. He'd have to go five rounds before... You know, whereas if I found that if you tapped on everything, that you get, it, you get it to go down faster. The other thing that I discovered, the other thing that I found, was that you can actually have things in your body that are away from your meridian system. Your meridian system does not cover your entire body. In fact, they have pathways. So you can literally have an emotion stuck right there in your bicep and your meridian system is not going to get to it. You can have somewhat, I got a chronic pain in my bicep, okay, EFT to the rescue. Even though I have this chronic body pain and rest of the I deeply and completely love and accept myself and you can go at it, at it, it's a little bit down but I can still feel it, it's still tingling and everything. So I've had people come to me who have been to EFT practitioner, who've tried the EFT and it's like, oh, I still got this kind of pain, kind of you know, all right, well, what's it connected to? Oh, well, things about my mom came up or things about I was bullied in school and it was this kid used to always beat me up and everything like that. And I, you know, I'd say something like, did you ever punch him back? No, he was bigger than me. Did you ever want to punch him back? Of course. And I'd get a pillow and say, punch the pillow. And what would happen, and this, this is something I just discovered through my own kind of experimenting with this when certain things wouldn't go any further. You have this thing locked in, you have this memory locked in, you just wanted to, you wanted to hit this guy because he was just bullying you, but he was just too, too much bigger than you. And you lock it in there. Now you've got the memory and you can deal with the memory. You remember this memory, you get all, oh, I'm angry now. So you get that to calm down, you get it to go down, but there's still this lingering, this lingering thing. And what I've found at times is that when you actually almost reenact it, it's almost like you fully go back. I've had people who've done EFT and tapped away all the stuff and they can think about it. They can even tell you about it with a sense of calmness, with no problem. Oh yeah, you know, he just, he'd punch me in my face and kick me around and they seem perfectly calm about it. You know, and, and, and they can tell about it. But there's this lingering kind of pain and they want it to go away. It's just agitating, you know, it's, it's just lingering there. And then I'd, you know, I'd say, all right, here's the cushion. I want you to... Visualize, God, visualize this guy's face on the cushion. I want you to just pound away on the cushion. And all of the emotions would come back. All of this stuff that was supposedly diffused. Because when you get it out of the system. And you work with movement. You work with movement. You know how important it is to move this stuff out of where it is. What I have found is when you move it out of particular muscles. Particular organs. Particular part of the body. It is back into the meridian system. And now you have access to it. So you can actually hit, hit, hit. And that's why I said, follow along. See where your arm starts to kind of flare or you're kicking and kicking or you're running. A lot of times I have people laying down. And this is, I'm sharing stuff with you that you can all do at home. I've done this by myself. I've had people laying down and they say, I can, just, I can feel this tension in my legs. And if I know that they were dealing with fear, you know what I tell them to do? Swish their legs back and forth like this. Just, just keep swishing your legs back and forth, and then I just, and, and, and I, you know, keep tapping on them, 
And I'd say speed it up, speed it up, speed it up. And I've seen people whose legs just start going crazy. And they're just sitting at the, pot, the top part of their body is completely calm. They're just relaxed. And their legs are almost, your legs go off by themselves. Because something happened and you wanted to run, but you never did. So you've got that locked in there. Certain things may have happened, you wanted to run, but you never did. Or, you find yourself in circumstances in life, you could get under stress, and you run. You run out of a job, you run out of a relationship. But what you're running away from was the thing you never got to run away from. In life, you will act out the things that you never got to do. If you never, if you never got to fight, I became a very violent person. I beat people up when I was in my teens and in my 20s. Because mom got the best of me. But I always wanted to get it back. I, that, those incidences, I was fused and ready to go to fight, but I knew I wasn't going to win. So I didn't do it. But that stayed with me. And you'll always look to reenact these things in some way or another. So people who have had fearful situations in their past where they didn't get a chance to run, will create circumstances through the laws of the secret and the law of attraction, you will create the circumstance in which you will have the opportunity to now run. So people run out of relationships, run out of jobs, when the reality is they wanted to run when they were little from some fearful situation. But it's never, ever, 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 ever satisfying. Because the original thing is the little kid that you have to have a dialogue with. That little child will always say, well, fine, you ran, but what about me? I never got to run. Fine, you're running and as an adult, you ran out, yeah, that felt good and everything, but what about me? I never got to run. So that's why sometimes when I work with people, I have them actually reenacted. In fact, they, I don't, you know, they don't, it's not like they sit down and we write a script and say, okay, now action. They end up in this situation. I ask people, what do you feel like? I have, sometimes I have them standing up and, and mind you, all these examples, these you can do on your own. I do this myself sometimes. I'll stand in a clear space, close my eyes and tap, and I'll say, what does it feel like? Oh, it feels like, put my arm up. Oh, it feels like kind of going like this way. And now I feel like I want to sit down. Or well, now I feel like I want to lay down on my side. Next thing you know, I feel like a little kid. And I'm crying, and then suddenly I'm remembering, you know, the night where I got scolded, and I, I wished someone would just come comfort me, and that's what was bugging me. You can reenact these things on your own if you allow yourself a level of honesty and a level of exploration to say, what's really troubling me? Because your immediate response is, I'm angry, he made me mad yesterday, and I'm still angry about it now. And if you stay insistent, it's him, it's all his fault that I'm angry. And you don't explore it and say, where is this anger really coming from? All right, yet yeah, he made me angry, but what part am I playing in it? How, how, how am I continuing to create this anger? Does it have to do with something else? And you explore it. And trust me, with your level of trust in yourself, your body will let you know. I was actually going to ask, you know, um, if somebody has a condition, or you have a condition, um, a physical condition, mm. um, and you've no idea how to possibly get in touch with it, you know what I mean? But yeah. you obviously know it's buried emotion or whatever. Yeah. So are you better off just dealing with what presents? So if you have X or Y emotion, yeah. then you just deal with that. So peel off the layers. Because it's one thing that I always found with EFT, um, you know, where to begin. I know at the beginning, but it's just mm. if you are trying to clear a particular, you know. So do you use the setup for the condition? I have this pain in my leg or whatever. So is that how you probably, is that the best? It is. You yeah. start you start only with your only with where you're comfortable. And remember, the master hor the master hormone is fear. Fear is the number one thing that your system is trying to keep you away from. So I have had circumstances where you start with something and you will only go but so far because you are afraid to go there. That's what you have to be mindful of. Wherever there is, you are afraid to go there. So sometimes you have to take small steps. And look, I have, um, <laughs> how many people remember the first time that their fluid came out of their system when they came into this world? How many people can remember that? No one. But through this work, I've remembered that. And it is scary. 
It is a horrible, horrifying, scary feeling when you spent nine months uh, breathing fluid. And now you're suddenly... And I did not know what the hell this was. Uh, just so you know, I've done a lot of tapping. <laughs> I mean, I want it all gone as much as I can. So I've allowed myself... I have, I have... Look, when you are open and creative and intuitive and honest with yourself, and you're going to say, you know what, I'm just... I'm going to see where this goes. When you're truly fed up with it, frustration... To meet the need through honest efforts. When you honestly get real with yourself and say, I'm going to find out what this is about. Um, be ready. Because the misinterpretations that you can make as a child, because you're trying to keep yourself safe. You know, you're trying to keep yourself safe. So, one day I'm tapping and, you know, I get this funny feeling in my gut kind of thing, you know, it's like, ooh, that just feels so uncomfortable, you know, I'm going to go with it, you know, I've had plenty of other stuff, tensions and everything, and I'm tapping, and, you know, and then it's getting more intense, it's like, whoa, <laughs> this is really getting, you know, what, and then I'm kind of buckling over, and then the next thing you know, I get this nauseous feeling, and then the next thing you know, I'm actually, the, you know, I'm thinking I'm going to vomit here, because it's like, mm -hmm. And, I'm like, and, and you're back away from stuff like that. The reason why I'm saying that to you is because I, I backed away. I actually would feel like I was going to vomit. And I would back away. I would, whoa, this is, I don't want to vomit. You know? And, and so I would back away from it. But then when I would go back, it would start over. And it's almost like, you got to go there. You have to go there. And you know what was amazing about the experience? Um, I'll continue it and then I'll let you know just like this epiphany that I had it was just it was it was just amazing because you, you experience something and then you see life it's like you go through these different chapters in life I always like to say it's like uh, when you watch a movie and it's very like intense and intriguing and it's like one of these mystery movies and then finally at the end they reveal one piece and suddenly the rest of the movie makes a different sense you know it was like that movie the uh, the sixth sense with uh, <laughs> yeah. with with, uh, with Bruce Willis yeah. and then at the end he discovered that mm -hmm. red was the symbol that he was dead because red would keep popping up and then all throughout the movie there was all these red, red this, red that. It's like that. You find, you get this piece and suddenly you go back and the whole movie makes a whole different sense. I kept going with this because it kept coming back. And I kept backing away from it. I was like, man, I don't want to vomit. That's not comfortable. That's not nice. You know, what is going on here? And I would go back into it again and I'd be buckling over and then a at a certain point, I just realized, all right, if I vomit and it comes out, I'll just clean it up. But this thing won't go away. It won't leave me alone. And I'm having some kind of reaction to something in my life. So at a certain point, I just kind of, I let it go all the way. And it was just like, ah. And I closed my eyes, and I swear to God, I felt like a little, tiny, fetus baby. Like, I remembered. Like, it's... it's I remember being this little child and it was the first moment that this fluid was coming out of my system and it was freaky. It was just, it, you know, it, just, it freaks you out when you're, when you're first born in life. You don't remember this stuff though. But it cleared a lot of things. And mind you, when you're early in life like that, stuff that scares you, really scares you. I mean, really scares you. So, it's like what I was saying earlier. Your, your mind has this system, it has these strategies. It's like, all right, make the heartbeat. That'll get him to stop. So then you don't stop. Oh, now give him the queasy test. Physiologically, you'll have the blood from your whole system. It'll go into your legs and into your arms. How many, how many, pop, how many, I've, how many people have heard of these incredible stories of, you know, a tree falling on a child and the mother comes over and picks up the tree? How the hell does she do that? Number one, that's just not physiology. That's energy. But your energy and your blood goes into your arms and goes into the legs and you have incredible strength and power. I mean, people pick other people up and throw them whatever. That's all of that going. So you're ready for that. So when the, when the, when the deer is running, it's trying to get away. At a certain point, it realizes when the tiger leaps and grabs it, I'm done for. Fighting is not an option. I won't win. Running was an option, but he caught me. So now I gotta freeze. And why do I freeze? Because I don't, I don't wanna feel this tiger eating away at me. 
We call it in human terms, dissociating. How many times have we heard of women being raped and they said they saw it from above? They went out of their body and watched it. They didn't want to be in there. You can leave your body and you can also come back to it. And a lot of people leave their body and don't come back to it. And that's the chronic freezing. And your body will start to shut down. You'll have cancer and so you need to be in your body in order for it to be alive. <laughs> and if you're not in your body, it'll start to shut down. But that's what freeze is. The problem with freeze in human terms is that we have this memory of freezing. The one, the, unfortunately, when we do repetitive things that are not good for us, if we're in a situation, a job for example, where someone is reminding us of something, we don't know it, and we're not comfortable there, then it's like you go back to this job, you're not running, although you'd like to run, and you're not fighting, although you'd like to fight. Freeze is the worst thing because you actually deteriorate. When your body, realize, when your body realizes you're not going to run, I'm giving you the energy to run, and then you got arthritis in your knees because you're not running. But fight, fight, do something. You're not going to fight, and now you have your arms are all kind of tense and funny, whatever the case may be. You don't do one of those two. Your body says, well, we've got to get you to freeze. And unfortunately, freeze means that you will go through a long deteriorating process. We're talking about cancer and all these kinds of things. Those are a form of freezing because you're not running and you're not fighting. So your system will literally shut down because you are not in you. You're dissociated. So it's very important to get, because fight is very intense. You know it. It's, it's like, you know, somebody's swinging at you. Oh my God, I, I, I got to fight back. So it's, it's very obvious. Flight is also very obvious. You just, you know, you see an exit, I'm getting the hell out of here. I see my opportunity to go, and you go. Freeze? No, you don't realize it. It's just like this day-to-day -day shutting down. It's also a part of depression. You're not dealing with something appropriately. And you're slowly shutting down and deteriorating yourself. So you have to be really careful with the depression thing, really careful with the freezing thing. And really determined when you use these kind of techniques to know that if you're in a numb state, you got to try to build something up. That's why a lot of when I work with people and they're really numb to their feelings, you kick something. You'll feel something then. Punch, hit, get your system alive. Wake it up so that you can get access to things. Because when you're really shut down and you need to thaw out, you got you got to you got to build that up because that was really deteriorating and debilitating. So you have to be really careful with that one. Because that freeze is the worst one. Because it's a slow death. You know, at least you, you, if you fight, it's quick. You know, if you, if you and your part, if you and your your, if you and your enemy have swords, you know, you lose. You get a dagger in the belly. You know it. You know, if you're running, and you get away, you know it. You have your victory dance. But if you're freezing, because you don't see those other two as an option, whew, that's a slow death. Because the reality is you can fight back by doing something different. Or you can run. You can just get away. <laughs> the amount of times I've had people sit across from me and they, you know, they say, you know, I say, oh, you know, I always ask people, so what's the problem? Tell me what the problem is. Oh, well, this, this, and that, and this, and that. And I say, well, why don't you quit your job? <gasps> what, do you, what do you mean? God, no, I couldn't do that. It's no, my mortgage and all and my lifestyle. But that's the solution, isn't it? You could just go. There's consequences to it, but you know, and I know, and we both know, you want to run. You want to get the hell out of there. Yeah, that's true, but I want, some, I want another solution. I can't do that one. So you'll freeze every day. You want to run, but you're not running. So you'll go back to work, and you'll freeze, and you'll shut down a little bit more, and you'll shut down a little bit more, and you'll shut down a little bit more. When the true solution, the honest solution, is find a way to get the hell out of there as quickly as possible. And I'm radical. I've been homeless. I've been in prison. I don't stick around in bad situations. <laughs> I get myself into bad situations by running away from not so bad situations, which I perceive to be bad situations. But I, I, I fortunately, in these unfortunate circumstances in my life, I don't have a fear of homelessness. So when someone says, if I say to a friend, I, in my past, when I was in dead-end jobs, you know, oh God, this isn't working out for me. You know, this isn't, oh, but this and that, and this and that, you know, 
I wouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't be able to absorb the idea of, oh, but you got to stick it out, you know, I mean, how are you going to pay the rent? I mean, you don't want to end up homeless. For a lot of people, ending up homeless is very terrifying, extremely terrifying. And the first, the first time I slept on the sidewalk, I was scared. Oh my God, I was so, I swore I was not, it was my last night on earth. I thought I was going to die. And I remember that and I realized, my God, people really think that. People will stay in a crappy job with a terrible mortgage because it's like, I don't want to be homeless. That's like death. People treat certain things in life, certain, like there's a big bear in the corner. I couldn't do that. My God, no, I'd die. People really think they'll die if they'll make certain decisions. And it's just, it's not, it's not true. But I have to respect that. I can't ask someone to go be homeless just because I survived it. These that I had to do when, well, with when I was nine years old. And what's interesting is, is, and I hear this all the time, I thought I had dealt with that. Hmm. How often? I thought I dealt with that. Do you know that, that I mean, certain experiences in life, you make what I call power statements. You as a child make certain statements that you will live by. That you will absolutely live by in life. And so certain things may happen. That one particular incident where I was beaten very badly and I was nine years old, that night, I spent the night coming up with all kinds of conclusions. I was afraid of the dark. Like I, 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 I dealt with my fear. I had a fear of the dark. This was after I did the tapping thing with, with feeling uncomfortable coming to the Buddha bag. Afterwards, I was like, yeah, I'm feeling heroic now. I'm going to go after this dark thing because I was afraid of the dark. And you know what I did? I went up in Brayhead at nighttime when there was no moon. And in fact, there was like clouds. And, and like, I saw it from a distance and I couldn't even see Brayhead because it was like mist, clouds coming out. And I was just like, all right, now we turn around. This is, this is, this is crazy. But I just sat tapped. I literally long, long, tapped all along the way. One of the most amazing ways that you can do this is find the trigger. You can use your imagination as much as you want and get as far as you can, but if you have a fear of elevators, go find an elevator and stand in front of it and get closer, inch closer to it, inch closer to it. So I went to Brayhead at nighttime and I walked up there by myself and, and, and I would have to keep stopping like every 50 meters because I'd get all, oh my God. <laughs> because she's getting freaked out. <laughs> Start tapping. <laughs> and fi you know, finally, you know, and I kept going up and it kept getting darker, but I can turn around and I can see the lights. So they kind of, <laughs> kind of this is like over there. <laughs> so, yeah, keep tapping because this is going to get scary. This is, like a scary. this is like a scary movie. Seriously. And I keep walking and, and, and so long as I can turn around and I can see the lights, I'm like, I'm not really in the dark. But it is kind of dark in front of me. So it's freaking me out. So I'm looking and I'm tapping. I'm kind of relaxing or I need to turn around and everything. So I keep going. And I keep going. And eventually I get to a point where I'm walking and suddenly I turn around and I can't see the lights. I was in the dark and I kind of froze. But I just kept tapping. Uh, I kept tapping. I said, oh my God, why am I so scared? Why am I so scared? And I'm looking and, and I'm realizing I'm just in the dark and there's not really, but I swore to God something was there. And as I'm tapping, and at this point I couldn't move because it's like, shit, if I go back or forward, I'm stuck. There's dark back there, dark this way, so I can't keep looking back. So I'm really in it. They're like, it's too late. You're done for. And so I'm literally, I'm not even moving forward anymore because I don't know where to move. But I keep tapping. And I swear to God, it's like, it's like the, the scariest movie, live, action. I literally felt someone running up behind me. And I couldn't do anything. Like I couldn't even turn around. But I literally felt the sensation of, oh my God, somebody's running up behind me. And just as the person came up and touched me, I turned into that nine-year-old boy again. Because when I went home that night, my mother let me come in the door. She was very quiet. She shut the door. I'm walking off into the living room, and she came running up behind me, and bang, and it all started. I was completely oblivious. I was doo 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 doo. I'm a little happy kid. I was out playing all night, and I got away with it. And no, I didn't. But literally, being in that circumstance, I felt the energy of someone running up behind me to grab me and beat me up. And as soon as that touch happened behind me, I just like transported. I was visually this nine-year-old kid. I was like, oh, you know, and, but it was very quick because as soon as I realized, holy shit, that's why I'm afraid of the dark. Then it kind of went away.
I mean, it went away really quick. Like, I ran up into Brayhead. I was running around in the trees and running, like, oh my god, I'm not afraid of the dark, this is great. I hope nobody sees me, because they're going to think I'm crazy out here. You know, and if they're out there, I should be scared. <laughs> Either that or they'll be scared. <laughs> they're, over, they're over there, like, who is that? Running around in the dark in Brayhead. <laughs> You do tap me too, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I had, I, I had a great time that night, and it was one of the ways that I realized, my God, if you're really going to deal with something, go face it. But take some real tools with you. Take some real legitimate tools with you and get closer to the thing. So you don't have to... In, in fact, a lot of times you won't know what it really has to do with. But just start there. You know there's something wrong. Something's not quite right. Where you logically know, I shouldn't really be afraid of the dark. Why? And you approach it. You go closer to it. And use whatever. You, like I said, you learn this in five minutes. You memorize it and it's yours to take wherever you go. It's yours. You own it. After that is a question of creativity, intuition, and honesty. And a determination to see wherever it is that you're going to go with it. Um, and one final thing I will say though. You can get to a certain point where you really need to sit down with someone else. Because you are the master of avoiding your own stuff. And there's something, uh, there's something about human openness when someone that you care about asks you a question. You want to tell them the truth. You might not tell yourself the truth. But if you're sitting with someone that you care about and you say to yourself, I, just, I, don't, want to, I don't want to feel like this anymore. That sometimes it's nice. I call them tapping buddies. You just sit with your buddy. And you can even just do this as a, a, a friendly ritual. It's like, hey, what you doing tonight? Let's do some tapping. Sit across from each other and say, what's bugging you? What's bugging you in life? Oh, well, this, that, and then kind of explore it. Because the important thing is safety. You have to feel safe. Certain things, if I didn't convince myself that I was safe, I wouldn't have done certain things. When I'm freaking out that I'm this little person freaking out, you can just jump out of it. You will jump out of it. I've seen people jump out of it. Like I've worked with people and I'm sitting there with them and they'll just go, you know, they'll... You know, and I'm, and I'm coaching in the sense of like, no, just look, no, don't worry. Don't try to make sense of it. Let your arms go wherever they're going and they're kind of, they're moving and, and just like, let it keep going. Let your legs go kind of thing, you know, and, and they're trusting and they're, and they're going with the flow of it, you know, but at a certain point, their eyes are closed and they're doing all the next thing. I was like, oh, wait, what the hell is this? What is, what am I? <laughs> You'll jump out of it because you're getting closer to something that's really uncomfortable. You're getting closer to the actual event. You're getting closer to the actual reenactment. It's called in hypnotherapy, ab reaction. You are reliving, literally reliving something old. And the power of reliving something old is you wake up. You feel it as if you were there and you wake up and it's like, wait a minute, I survived that, didn't I? I'm still here. That's what you have to get to. You have to get to that dialogue where you say, hey kid, I know you were freaked out, scared. But look, you survived it. We can let it go now. We can just let it go now and defuse it using these different techniques. And there's other techniques, there's other things out there. I'm just, this is the one that I mainly work with. But by all means, seek out all kinds of other things that can defuse this stuff from the past. So I've, I've, I promised myself I would not go over. I swore I wouldn't. I, I'm even getting teased online. Because I have a talk tomorrow at the RDS and it's 45 minutes and people are like, yeah, right. You know, and I'm saying, yeah, the security guards have to come in and grab me. He's like, all right, your time is up, sir. <laughs> so thank you very much for making this a wonderful evening of the alternative Buddha bag night. And I'll continue to do this, but in, in the next time that we have a break, I'll be seeking out other people to give presentations. It'll just be another Buddha bag night. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it.